from representatives from McDermott Aviation via video conference. For the Hansard record, could you please each give your name and the capacity in which you appear today? Good morning, all. I'm uh, John McDermott. Uh, I'm Chief Pilot, uh, Head of Operations, and the uh, owner of McDermott Aviation uh, Helicopter Company, uh, based in Queensland but established throughout Australia. And Tim Verko, I'm John's Quality and Safety Manager for for the McDermott Group. Terrific. I invite you to make a brief opening statement before the committee asks questions. And do you wish to make an opening statement? For us? I guess I would like to uh, have it on record that uh, we are not CASA-bashers, which has been a, a term used over the years, if you don't agree with CASA. Um, we're, we're happy. We, we recognise uh, regulators are necessary. Um, we went within uh, uh, three, in fact, four different uh, authorities throughout the world, the FAA, uh, PNG, uh, Civil Aviation, and uh, the EAS system in New Caledonia. Yeah. Um, we operate safely and fine within those regulations, as we do within CASA. Our problem with CASA is that we've uh, we've been fed a set of uh, regulations that, to be quite honest with you, are just far too onerous to understand, um, very, very difficult to comply with. Um, define the uh, Civil Aviation Act of 1988, where it says uh, economic consideration and uh, should be given to impact any regulation. So we we would like to see the outcome of this being has it actually really working with us as an industry, identifying that uh, general aviation is a big part of the Australian uh, aviation industry, far bigger than airline industries. Um, the, the role we play in uh, helping out the communities of Australia in all the roles that general aviation does and how important it is. So, so we really want to work with CASA to find outcomes that actually happen instead of putting band-aids over broken uh, regulations. That's our state. Thank you. Thank you. Senator. Thank you very much. Senator Patrick, would you like to commence with your questions, please? Yeah, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Mr McDermott, can you uh, just uh, describe the size of your company and where it operates from? OK, our company is uh, head office is in, uh, on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Um, we've got uh, bases, uh, um, fixed wing and helicopter bases throughout Queensland, uh, around the Sunshine Coast. We also got an operation in uh, Bankstown, New South Wales. We've got an operation in Victoria. We conduct operations in uh, Tasmania and uh, a significant um, base in Western Australia. We've got a permanent staff of around 130 and that balloons out during our busy season, during the firefighting season, up to about 145. Uh, we also conduct operations in uh, New Caledonia, French New Caledonia, Indonesia. Um, this year we were working in Greece and on occasions we get seconded to do operations in, uh, in the USA, mainly in support of firefighting, but sometimes uh, uh, response to uh, uh, ship soldiers, which we did in New Zealand a number of years ago on the arena. Would you be kind enough to tell us how your your company has changed over perhaps the uh, the last decade? Uh, and I'm, I'm really just trying to get a sense of people have transmitted to this committee that general aviation is in decline, in serious trouble. Uh, are you a sort of thriving industry? Or have you shared those struggles? Have you watched competitors around you fall away, or is it uh, is it in fact? Uh, been static over that time? Um, it would be fair to say we have actually um, uh, done okay in the last 10 years. 
um, despite some of the regulations we've had to work with. Um, I would suggest some of the smaller operators have been more impacted. Um, uh, the single biggest uh, impediment to our expansion currently is aircraft engineering, uh, obtaining guys or people to come into the industry, which we're working actively with our own training academy to do that. Uh, getting uh, engineers licensed has been a big problem for all of general aviation. Um, and, you know, it, we have now a team of about uh, three people, certainly two and a half people, work pretty much all the time within the CASA regulation format to, uh, to assist us uh, to comply with all regulations and requirements that we're up to. Okay. Um, um, if I can, sorry. can I just add, well, that um, our ability to, to prosper in the last 10 years has largely been through our ability to operate overseas and under those other um, jurisdictions. So, for example, our FAA registered aircraft and our FAA um, maintenance organisation has enabled us to, to expand to the point that we are now. Well, you mentioned um, New Caledonia and uh, Greece. Uh, FAA, uh, I, I associate with the United States. Uh, are you operating in the United States? Uh, we don't operate per se in the United States. We are sometimes um, uh, asked to go in and operate under a, other, another company's um, operating certificate. Um, but in the last couple of years, that hasn't been an opportunity that's been available to us. But for that reason, that's why we have FAA, which are N registered aircraft, foreign registered aircraft. Okay. And w what is your experience between the Australian jurisdiction? and say the French and Greek uh, jurisdiction and indeed your experience with FAA regulations? So within the Greek system, we were working under an operating certificate in Greece under our FAA uh, operating uh, certificate. So we actually didn't have any interface with the Greek um, authorities. Uh, EASA through the French, is uh, very complex um, and uh, is a model that 15 years ago we, we were in consultation with CASA then and we said the ASA system is not the system for general aviation to be, to be following. Um, throughout Europe, general aviation basically does not exist anymore and it's because of some of the uh, obstacles that Part 66 and 61 of them are imposing upon us here in Australia. Okay, so do you, do you say that the FAA uh, rules represent the gold standard in terms of the right balance between safety and uh, uh, and the ability to be able to operate under reasonable regulation? Absolutely. If we had to have a choice, the FAA system um, still complex, but it's workable. Um, it's clear, it's concise, it's not as open to individual interpretation as our CASA regs are. Um, in fact, many years ago we were asked as an industry what rules we thought would work for uh, general aviation in Australia. Um, the New Zealand model was put forward and we find the New Zealand model, though we don't actually operate under it, a very straightforward operation. And Papua New Guinea actually um, took the New Zealand model and, and uh, modified that to suit their regime. And we actually find the PNG model extremely workable and extremely uh, good. One thing too. Yep, sure. And just to add to that also, um, the FAA regulations that um, may not be the best uh, around, but the differences in the way that it's uh, way that it's used by the regulator. The regulator has a very strong uh, focus on, on keeping uh, operators flying under the reg set, so they're very helpful in finding ways to, to achieve things under the regs rather than finding ways to use the regs not to do things. So, so just my final to question. Give, give, Sorry. Yes. I was going to say, to give you a very small example, 
under the FAA system, we had to advise the FAA that we were going to Greece to work. Um, and we got a reply from our FAA um, uh, primary maintenance inspectors and uh, flying operations inspectors saying thank you for the notification and we wish you well for your endeavours in Greece, da 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 da. Uh, we tried to go to uh, Fiji to work with one of our helicopters about six years ago and after, 18, oh, after 12 months it became all too hard and we just didn't go and uh, the whole time it was because of obstacles put up by by the regulations that were um, uh, in place and that the CASA guys had to adhere to. So, so uh, this le le leads to my final question, uh, Chair. Um, I I'm just trying to understand, when you say the FAA system is better, is it a case that the regulations are less voluminous? Is it a case of uh, the, the response, as you just talked about, is, is much better? Uh, is it an attitude, or uh, is, it, is it to do with attitude? Can you just elaborate on on the on what it is that is good about the FAA system in contrast to Australia's uh, system of regulation? It, it's all of those things, yeah. um, and and in addition to that, it's the recognition that the FAA system has across all the other jurisdictions in the world. So when we go to Greece. Um, the, uh, the, the Greek or the EASA, for example, will, rec will cross-recognise FAA licensing, registration, uh, airworthiness issues and so on. So it's a well-recognised system for operating in just about any part of the world. Um, and then it's those other three things that you mentioned. It's, the, it's a relatively, um, uh, relatively small reg set, I guess by comparison with, with CASA. Uh, the attitude of the regulator is about keeping operators operating uh, and it's about, about the flexibility that they can apply to the regs and, uh, and uh, to get, get outcomes. Senator, also, um, part of my, uh, well, my, my original background is I'm a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer, so would be now affected by Part 66. During uh, during CAS's uh, discussions with, with adopting the EASA system, we were told that our licences would transfer to an EASA-styled licence and that would give us recognition throughout the world. Well, I own an operation in New Caledonia, a French helicopter company in New Caledonia as well. I have aircraft licences under my uh, uh, Australian uh, Part 66 licence. And to be honest with you, I'm not allowed to sign out a lawnmower in um, in New Caledonia because the ESA don't recognise our qualifications. They don't re recognise our um, release forms. So, for example, if, if a company other than McDermott Aviation and Maintenance Organisation wanted to overhaul transmissions for Bell helicopters or Eurocopter helicopters or whatever and export them to America or to France or to Europe or wherever, our release notes, our, our Form 1 releases, are not recognised anywhere outside of Australia. And FAA advised us that the reason for that was because a number of years ago, the FAA got away around with all the local uh, or the various countries with their various authorities and said, let's sit around on the table and work out how we can do cross-recognition. And CASA didn't attend the meeting. OK. Thank you, Chair. Well so thank you, Senator Patrick. That is that leads me very neatly into my questions, Mr. McDermott. So, can you tell me who is coordinated with the FAA? Um, which other countries in our region? Uh, in, in sorry, what sense, Senator McDermott? Oh well, you're just using that example of of um, a casino. Oh, okay, so America. New Zealand's New Zealand um, New Zealand has released the tickets under their system which can be recognised um, throughout other jurisdictions. Um, to be honest with you, in our region there's probably not a lot of other um, organisations, uh, you know, countries that have organisations that would be in the export business. But certainly it's an impediment to Australian uh, providers. Yeah, I would have thought that given that Australia uh, operates in the world market, um, the international market, that that recognition between you know a big jurisdiction like particularly like the US uh, would be um, important. Uh, and again, as you say, as an export market. Um, 
Okay, we might come back to that. Uh, it's very... Ask... That they, they talk about free trade between all our jurisdictions. Um, I'm not sure if you're up to what is electrical terminology, but our free trade in the aviation industry is like a diode. It only flows one way. So it's very detrimental to those of us who are trying to conduct business. Um, it's 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 just a it's just a major roadblock for anybody who who really wants to get into into providing services uh, into other jurisdictions. All right, so that might be something that um, the the secretary can take note of around a recommendation on this um, reduction of of. Um, uh, of non-tariff barriers to aviation exports uh, in our region. Um, I want to go to a, a submission that you, you probably won't have had an opportunity to read um, from Harold Carter, and he talks about consistency between CASA offices and within CASA offices, so that if uh, somebody has written a, a manual, um, that it is uh, that there is a, a, a broad working document that um, CASA offices across the country um, make decisions around the same, uh, same framework. Uh, and Mr Carmody had said that he would establish an office within CASA that would deal with con uh, concerns of inconsistency between CASA offices. Um, I wonder, have you got any commentary around consistency of decision making between CASA offices, you know, in different um, parts of the country, or even yes. different CASA offices within your part of the country? Yes. Um, factually, the only thing um, um, consistent within CASA is the inconsistency. Um, we we have. Um, like on, on yeah, for, for the last probably eight years, um, we apply for a certain uh, uh, privilege, uh, you know, whether it's to, to, to instruct some of our pilots or to, to do courses or whatever. We get told by a certain individual in office, no, you can't do that. And we go, well, give us a reason why, because we believe under the regs we can do it. Oh, that's their interpretation. So then we'll go to another place and get another interpretation. And this goes back to a, a type rating test that we we just had have basically, we think, cleared up in the last week or two to do with one of our helicopter types that we use for firefighting. In August last year, I sat with two flying operations inspectors. We came to a conclusion um, on how we would go about it and then their management got hold of it and it went around and around and around in circles. We got a uh, we got an exemption in January of this year to actually do what those two flying operations inspectors had suggested that we were going to do in August last year, but was overridden. So that enabled me to do two flight tests. And then since then, to be honest with you, you know, COVID has paid an impact. But we've just we've just played a game of tennis where the volley just goes forever and um, um, not because of people's necessarily desire not to help, it's because of interpretation by individuals of certain regulations. It's just most for we, we would We've been issued a 142, which is a training uh, uh, document. And and it's attached to one of our N-registered Bell 214s on a discrete AFC. So we've gone back and challenged that because there's no reason that it should be. Our local guy says it should be. We go back to Canberra and they say, oh no, he's misinterpreted, it shouldn't be. So for God's sake, if they can't sort it out, how in the hell are we supposed to sort it out? So do you think that this approach has driven up the cost of doing business for your business? Have you had to hire experts or taking time out of the business that you would normally be you know working in it um to to manage these interpretation issues and compliance issues senator mcdonald <laughs> i spend 
a disproportionate amount of my time trying to help manage issues with CASA. I mean, it's been identified by our safety risk that CASA is now the biggest risk, safety, uh, risk to our business model. So I've got documents here that go back to type ratings for engineering that started in 2017 when we identified a, a, an issue. So I got involved in it by 2018. It still hasn't been resolved, but as late recently as yesterday, I was dealing with trying to resolve it. And it's so, you know, instead of me running a business that employs a lot of people and generates good income and supports a big community, I'm dealing with things that shouldn't be this complex that I don't have to deal with under the FAA system or under the PNG system. So I just want to clarify then that, that you as a successful and um, you know significant operator in the industry, and you flag you don't want to bash CASA, and I really respect that. I don't want to lead you. Um, uh, I, I, I can see that you're trying to be productive in the recommendations that you're making. Um, but do you think that um, operators are fearful about you know being as, as bold as you are and being public in your concerns and, and identifying these issues? I have no doubt that there are uh, there are people who who would probably um, would just not do something because they, they aren't in a position maybe to take CASA on and to spend the time and resources trying to get to a, a conclusion. And there are numerous people that I know of in the local helicopter community have faced obstacles that they haven't been able to overcome. Um, as far as retribution, I, I can't honestly say that we feel necessarily that. I mean, we feel frustration and what have you. And like everything in business, we don't have to love everybody. But we have identified that even the people who don't necessarily agree with our views, we have to be able to work with them. So, yeah, uh, I, I'm sure it has an impact. And, and you know, CASA do wear, carry a big stick. I mean, uh, you know, they can make a, a, a small operator's life damn misery um, by uh, going out and threatening uh, to remove uh, certificates and all that. All right. I'm not saying that. Yeah. Um, so is there, you know, there, there's a huge amount of ground to cover and you may want to uh, make an additional submission following um, our conversation today of anything that you want to clarify or um, additional examples that you'd like to provide. But can I ask you, are there three things or just a couple of things you think government could do to ensure that CASA is actually adding value to the GA sector? In your opinion? Um, uh, CASA have identified that it's government responsibility to change uh, regulations. So maybe uh, they should um, uh, work again alongside of industry to, to achieve that. Um, uh, CASA really should, uh, yeah, I think just be working closer to, to industry to, um, to to get uh, the regulations that are workable instead of consultation is not coming up with a set of rules and then force fitting them to us. It's, it's actually working with us. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of ways that, uh, that it could be improved, not necessarily with one bullet or one band-aid, but uh, Tim, maybe yeah. you deal with... Yeah. yeah, yeah. there are a couple of things um, I just wanted to add to to um, what John was saying before about CASA. Sometimes it's not it's not the adverse uh, finding or the adverse interpretation that's the problem. It's the interminable discussion about it or the, or the differences of opinion that just make things just go longer and longer. And so it's, all, it's, it's death by attrition rather than by uh, an axe. <clears throat> in some of those findings, and for smaller organisations, that, that those time frames can be killers. Um, I think just in terms of the three things, um, there, there was uh, uh, the need to. It, it's been raised several times before. We need to change the act to recognise commercial uh, uh, viability as an outcome, 
as well as safety. So the safety uh, uh, on a on a on a jumbo jet or an A380 or something is completely different to what it would be in a Cessna 172. So going for the highest possible level of safety is actually a killer for for smaller aircraft and and, uh, and GA, where they're dealing in a riskier environment uh, anyway, and they need to be able to to juggle safety uh, to make sure that they get a safe outcome, but but that they also stay in business. Um, managing our own yeah, risk. Managing, yeah. That's right. It's a risk management process. The other thing, I guess, is yeah, recognising the structural flaws in, in training for pilots and engineers because the other thing that's killing the industry is that the age class of all the skills in the business are getting older and older and the pathways to replace those skills are getting more and more tortuous. Um, we didn't mention before, but, but one of the advantages under the FAA system is that we're able to recognise skills much easier in the learning cycle than we can through uh, a licensing, particularly in maintenance. So, so those flaws in training and, and, and licensing would be good to deal with. Um, and also the whole thing about cross-recognition, uh, and in particular with FAA in the US, um, most of our aircraft and, and so on are made in the US or, or Europe, so it makes sense to have our, our training and skills base and, and certification and so on uh, matched with those uh, and aligned with those jurisdictions. We've spent a huge amount of money virtually making sure that we're not aligned, uh, so that's a huge flaw in the system as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, just before I hand back to Senator Patrick for a last question, I, I just want to ask you, um, the, the changes that have been made in regulation uh, by CASA over the last, let's say, 10 years, but it's possibly a little longer, um, do you have any sense of whether or not it has made the industry safer? Are we, you know, for all the additional regulation and costs, are we seeing an industry that's safer? Senator Macdonald, CASA doesn't make industry safer. Regulations don't make industry safer. We make industry safer because <laughs> there are so many, um, so many uh, reasons for us to be safe, um, other than just adhering to a, a regulation, which we've got to do. Um, I don't believe. I believe we're safe despite CASA. At the moment, I actually could suggest that there would be operations at present that are operating outside uh, of CASA's regulations, probably unknowingly, that are operating safely because um, the regulations that are there at the moment, for example, in uh, certifying of some aircraft or various uh, type rating recognitions or training recognitions are not being complied with per CASA, um, but are actually being done and are being done safely, as I say, despite the regulations. So, in all honesty, I cannot see uh, the statistics to say that aviation is safer because of any rule implications uh, of CASA that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, you know, aviation does have risk associated with it. You know, I mean, you know, if you want to stay safe, don't go flying, maybe, but um, uh, it's all about risk mitigation. It's all about responsibility for our own actions. Um, we, we, despite what Kazza think, we are actually the experts of what we do. Uh, we, we do significant amount of work in, in quite risky uh, areas uh, with certain uh, lifting jobs. We have to go to CASA to get an exemption. So we've already done all the risk mitigation. We've already done all the uh, assessment of what perceives as the risk to us. The next thing a guy from CASA comes along and says, yeah, but I want you to do this and this and that at the moment. And we go, well, we don't like that. We don't know whether it's the best outcome. So as I asked Mr. Carmody one day, if you want us to get CASA to give us that way of doing it. Are you going to accept the responsibility for that job if it goes wrong? Because we've already done our risk matrix and this is the best way to do it. Now you're coming along and telling us, but we want you to do this as well. And we're going, well, we don't, we don't necessarily agree with that. I mean, it's not in anybody in that aviation industry's uh, interest to be unsafe, to not do the right thing. It's not in our interest. No, and if you use that um, 
you know, it has been put to me about uh, that there needs to be additional regulations to make industry safer, and yet we accept that, you know, hundreds of people a year die on, on roads in car accidents and uh, and other things, um, and, and yet we understand a risk mitigation process of, you know, wearing seatbelts and, and all those um, regulations, but we certainly don't stop people from driving because there has been an accident. No, no, no. And I think it would be fascinating to to understand what it costs industry in terms of compliance with CASA regulations, particularly as Mr Burko identified the length of time. And if you could spend that amount of, of um, effort and money in, you know, going back into your business, how much more successful and uh, um, and safer could you potentially be? So. Mm. Um, uh, Senator Patrick has a, a last question. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. This goes to your statement about uh, A380s versus Cessna 172s. Um, I, I just wonder, was it really two questions? Back in uh, on October the 24th last year, the Parliament passed a bill that caused a change to the Civil Aviation Act and uh, most relevantly in Section 9, uh, there was a section 93 uh, added that says, subject to subsection 1, which is about safety, um, in developing and promulgating aviation safety standards under paragraph 91C, CASA must A, consider the economic and cost impact, uh, impact on individuals, businesses and the community of the standards, and B, take into account the differing risks associated with different industry sectors. Firstly, are you aware of that change to the regulation, or to, sorry, to the uh, primary legislation? And secondly, have noting it's a year gone by, have you seen a change in approach by CASA, uh, mindful of that new law? Um, I'll take that one first. I, I was aware that that, uh, that change has been discussed for a long time. I actually wasn't aware that it, was, it had been enacted. Um, and certainly, we haven't seen any any um, any evidence of that, uh, and any outward evidence anyway. I'm not sure what the discussions may or may not have been in CASA, but we haven't seen any anything related to that at the at the coalface. And maybe, you know, there's a there is a tendency for um, maybe even it comes down to area managers who are risk averse. Um, Disallowing, um, disallowing things to happen, but based on the fact that they perceive it might be a higher risk, so they're going to say, no, we're not going to do it, we're not going to allow it. Or in one instance, just recently, one of the managers said, oh, but I don't think that's right. And no disrespect to him, I said, but I don't really, it's not up to whether or not you think it's right or not. The regulation says I can do it. Um, you know, wh 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 where's the law here? Where's the regulation? Um, None of us are talking about lowering the standards of safety. I don't believe, as I said to Senator McDonald, that's that's in anybody's interest. But there is a dis different risk matrix um, between uh, four people flying around in a Cessna 172 with two means of escaping out of the aeroplane compared to a, a, an A380 where there's 400 people and half a dozen means of escape from the aeroplane. So. That's how I would interpret uh, maybe the juggling, but it's not about us trying to water down uh, any safety um, or, or encourage cowboyism, whereby um, you know people could just go out and, in fact, people can go out and do what they damn well like because they call it private flying. <laughs> um, and sports aviation. Not that I'm knocking it. I don't think it's a great thing. Don't yeah, get me wrong. Yeah. Mr. Mr. McDermott, I was really just after what uh, the the answer that Mr. Verko gave, which is uh, he wasn't aware of oh, the re <laughs> regulation and that that in fact there has been no change. And and uh, I, th I think yeah. that's uh, uh, th that was the burden of my question. But thank you. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Off me. You're on mute, Chair. Thanks very much for that. Uh, thank you. We are out of time, uh, Mr McDermott, Mr Verco. 
Uh, I would invite you, if there's uh, any additional issues that have been raised following the questions today or that you didn't have the opportunity to answer or to be asked, um, I would encourage you to put in um, a further uh, submission. I really appreciate your time, your contribution, and um, please be assured that uh, this committee is very committed to understanding what the regulatory impost is on uh, particularly general aviation and helicopters, and uh, yeah, again, really value your input today. So go, please go with the committee's thanks. We appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, and wish you well.